You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Ah, mmm. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. And we do have a new caller today. So, great day. Always love New Caller Day. And the first word I see when I click on the transcription is the word sex. So this should be interesting. Hey, Ryan. This is Ethan from Maryville, Tennessee. Um, hey. First time caller, but long time listener, man. I've been listening since uh, 2019 when um, the dairies had four sacks. And oh, sacks. The, uh, Google it's sacks. North. Seems like forever ago. I appreciate Basically, it, man. man I, was, uh, I was wanting to save my call until we won the Super Bowl, but I don't see that <laughs> happening anytime soon. Dang it. So I kind of want to talk about scheme a little bit and uh, draft prospects or prospect um, because I feel like we all have been talking about the same thing for weeks and Good really call. every game's starting to feel the same way. But just, uh, just a couple questions. I don't know if you've seen the NFL draft order right now. Um, I believe off the top of my head it's Bears with the first pick. Giants have the second pick. Yep. Patriots. Either Arizona, I think, has the third pick, and then New England, and back to the Bears and the Packers. And to be honest, man, I think that it's going to be like that for the rest of the way. So we're probably going to be picking with um, near the top five, probably round six. Yeah. Hopefully, we right. get past Arizona with Kyler coming back, but I'm not too sure. But there's um. Two quarterbacks that I think are going to go early. So it's Caleb Williams and Drake May. And then both the tackles. And I really like the tackles in this class, yeah. um, especially Joe Walt. But they all go early. And then Marvin Harrison with uh, probably the Cardinals pick. But I was just wondering uh, your thoughts on Brock Bowers. I think he could help us in the pass game and the run game a lot. Um. If he's the best player available, I would love to take him. But uh, I don't really know how often we run, like, two tight end sets. I was hoping you could, like, uh, tell me about that. But I really sure. appreciate the show, man. I didn't want to spend too much time. Go back up. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, he does call back in in a little bit, so I'll get to the second call. But um, I actually haven't watched – Brock Bowers. And the only reason is because not only do I not see us taking a tight end in the top 10, although it's obviously possible, because we got Musgrave and Kraft last year, it just, in my mind, makes it even less likely. Not impossible. I'm not going to be that guy that's like, the Packers would never. I'm not going to say that. But I, I just, you know, unlikely, I think, is a fair statement. But just a quick overview of how things are going right now. Six foot four, 240, tight end out of Georgia. Um, there has been. I don't know if this is massively talked about or what. I don't know what the conversation around Brock Bowers is. I see he's been going up in the rankings or whatever. So I'm guessing this isn't mass. Oops, turned it down. Massively talked about. But despite having an 86 PFF grade and an 87 receiving grade, I don't think he's actually doing very well. And the reason I say that is because, first of all, 
his grades are lower than they have. So it went from a 92 to a 90 to an 86. But worse than that, his grades are actually 60, 40, 70, 80, 90, 70, 50, 60. So there's a four-game stretch where it was 70s, 80s, and a 90 against Auburn. The four on either side, though, are 60, 40, 50, and 60. So half of his games have not been very good from a grade standpoint, which if you're going to take a tight end, which is a non-premium position, in a premium spot, like top five, top 10, you can't be giving me three years of regression and 50% of the time I'm at least good and 50% of the time I'm not. And that includes games against Tennessee Martin and Ball State and Vanderbilt and Ole Miss. Like, this isn't like the top five or the top four teams where I struggled the most. From a blocking standpoint, he has a 72 run blocking grade and a 75 pass blocking grade, which is fine. But, you know, I mean, it's like his highest run blocking grade is a 73 and his lowest is a 58. He's right in that like good, not great range, which I guess is fine. I just wonder if that, you know, you get into the pros and it just goes to just straight up not great. And, you know, receiving, again, it, it kind of follows the, the games where he graded out really well. He had 121 yards, two touchdowns, 157 yards and a touchdown, 132 and a touchdown. And I'm sure you people look at those games and are like, this guy's a stud. But, you know, Ball State, three targets, one reception, three yards. South Carolina, nine targets, seven receptions, 54 yards. You know, four receptions, 22 yards. I just, I don't know about the whole, th- th- there's just a much higher standard in my mind of a tight end that I'm going to call a lock, which is almost never a thing. Every time we have these guys that are can't miss prospects and we take them in the top 10, how often do they actually meet expectations? Pretty much never. Kyle Pitts seemed like he was going to be, but no. TJ Hawkinson, no. Um, Eric Ebron, no. They might be okay, but not necessarily top five, top ten okay. But anyways, to the second part of the question. Right now, if we look at um, plays in which there are two tight ends on the field, Jordan Love as a quarterback ranks uh, ninth, 73 of his drop back. There have been two tight ends on the field. If you look at three tight ends on the field, um, Jordan Love and the Packers, 18th, only five times has that been a thing, according to SIS. That's out of 337 dropbacks. So that would be um, 21.7% of the time we have two tight ends on the field. Let's, call it, let's just call it 25% of the time we have multiple tight ends. And for those wondering, um, the Chargers are the only team that have had four tight ends. They did it twice. But let's get to the second part of the call. Hey, sorry, I had um, someone calling me, so I had to rush that a little bit. Um, if you come back to this message, um, just to clarify my last one, um, I would love to pick a tackle or an offensive lineman in the draft. Um, I think they're really top-heavy and they look good, but with the way Josiah has been playing lately and just to put another weapon in the offense, I think Brock Bowers could out for a lot for the um, pass game and the run game. And... Um, I don't know if he's the best available person on the board. I'm sure Butte would take him. But I was just wondering how many um, two tight end sets we play and do you think he'd be a good fit? All right, thanks. And the fit fit is the other part of the equation. I mean, there's nothing wrong with – I mean, and, and I, don't, I don't know. I Again, I, I got to watch him because that might change everything that I'm saying about him. I don't know, but um, I feel like he is sort of like a Luke Musgrave. And I'm I'm sure the Packers wouldn't necessarily mind having two really good receiving tight ends. And maybe Brock Bowers is like an elite blocker also, and you could use him as a Josiah DeGuara, in which case it's maybe worth a little bit more consideration because then you would have the three different types of tight ends. It's just a question of now, do you want like an H back as a top 10 pick? And you're right, if he's, you know, best player available, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that would assume that they don't see you know, Fashanu or Joe Alt or any of these guys as top 10 picks. Because if they do, they're going to lean that way before they would take a tight end. So again, it's possible. I just, I really would be pretty shocked. I mean, honestly, just, just glancing at this, I'd be almost surprised if he went as early as he's expected to go, especially considering there's so many premium positions. You know, you got quarterbacks, you got tackles, you got edge rushers, you got corners, like all the elite positions and and wide receiver which is becoming a premier position basically those guys are just loaded in the top 10 you know i mean if it was like running backs and linebackers and stuff that were at the top be like all right brock's got a shot he's kind of the odd man out there's no good running backs or premier running backs or you know interior offensive linemen or safeties it's all just premier positions so 
We'll see. I mean, look, if the, if the Packers go on a win streak and they start picking 12th, 13th, then Brock were to fall, I think then we could maybe kind of look at it. But my guess as of right now would be probably not. Hey, Kyle from Madison hey. again. I also want to say, like, and I really hope there isn't, like, love slander this week. Cause I, I don't know why. Like, yeah, people will be frustrated at interception, but, like, I don't hate it. That point in the game, it's it's not such a terrible throw. Like, make a play on it or knock it down in that. I mean, it's okay. And then, like, at the end of the game, whatever. Like, yeah, you're trying something. You're trying to go to Watson, you're trying something. There's one play to go, you know. But, like, overall, like, hey, do you want, like, if you gone to my head, you want Pickett or you want love right now? <sighs> Are you kidding me? You watching that game? You want love all freaking day. Well, look, again, I, I think the overall takeaway should be that love had a good day. That's that's what I think the overall takeaway should be. I don't think we're quite at the point where it's like, okay, he's definitely the guy. Um, and I definitely don't want to get into the, uh, um, you know, creating false choices. Like, <laughs> you know, you have to pick, either love or pick it. It's like, well, what, can I pick neither? Would that be an option? Or I'm not saying I'm choosing neither. I'm just saying it's kind of an unfair statement, I guess. I mean, you look like a starting NFL quarterback out there today. Um, yeah, some mistakes, but like, I, I thought I was watching JTL Sullivan, uh, quarterback school this week, and, and there was a pass last week to Musgrave that I thought Musgrave kind of made a little bit of a mess up. He caught it, but he like turned his body weirdly where I thought if he just kept kind of right, going, right, right. the thing will just come right down in front of him and he'd catch it. And I had to listen to everybody on the freaking internet lose their minds about what a bad throw that is. And I just didn't, I just didn't agree with that. And, and last, I was watching uh, the quarterback school, and, and I thought he made a good point. He said, look, Green Bay Packers fans, I don't know what to tell you. you. You know, you're spoiled watching the guy with the most accurate arm, you know, and probably in history. But he said about that throw, that is a perfectly awesome NFL throw. Like, you, you know, he puts it right there for Musgrave last week, and everybody's losing their mind, and I just thought that was a perfect example of it. And this week, I mean, he, I thought he had some great throws and some really good poise, and, like, the receivers made some plays. Some. Some is fair, but it's it's still a question of how many, right? I mean, l- look, we can say things like, well, you're spoiled because of Aaron Rodgers, but we can also look at the completion percentage and see that it's, 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 it's not like Aaron Rodgers was the number one in NFL history and Jordan Love is like a top five quarterback and we're complaining about it. That's not what's happening. He's like bottom of the NFL in, in his accuracy. Now, that hasn't been the case the last couple of weeks. But again, it's it's unfair to just have these sweeping generalizations of well, you're you're only doing this because you're spoiled. No, I'm. You can't be bottom five and then say, well, you're just spoiled because of Aaron Rodgers. We've gone over the stats. We've looked at how terrible he's been deep down the field. And again, that's why I'm giving him credit this week because it was great this week. But I mean, bad throws are bad throws, and underthrown balls are underthrown balls. It's just it's just a reality. I don't know exactly which one you're talking about, Musgrave. I know this week again, I agreed he like turned his body, which you didn't need to if he just kept running and let it come over his shoulder, just track the ball. You could keep running rather than, you know, turning and stumbling and falling or whatever. Um, so I agree on that if we're talking about kind of the same thing. Um, but a lot of these, it's wide receivers getting blamed for just terrible balls, just flat out. And I'm seeing people like post examples, like look at how guys are, it's like, that's not the same thing at all. Like, look at that touchdown to Jaden Reed. That's how you do it. Like, bro, that was over his shoulder, he was running in stride, and there's no defenders there. Like, give me a freaking break, dude. You're just lying at this point. Like, this is dumb. This is just completely dumb. And that's not to say Watson's been perfect. And yes, I mean, again, it's not even to say that some some of these are impossible to catch, but some of them are not. But it's still like, it's it's a it's a 5-10% catch. I saw even uh, Clayton had posted a thing about, you know, so, somebody had said something like, underthrown deep balls are like never a bad thing because it's a pass interference every single time. And he was like, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, but then even in the comment section, like, look how he fought for that ball, bro. He didn't catch it. He didn't catch Jerry. Judy didn't catch it. The defender broke it up. It was an underthrown ball and he didn't catch it. And your, your takeaway is look how he fought for it. <laughs> like, I don't understand this. Again, everybody's posting all this stuff about look at look at how Romeo Dobbs does it. Like Dobbs did the same thing. There are a bunch of underthrown balls to Dobbs that he didn't catch, and that's why the whole narrative was nobody on this team is fighting for the balls. I mean, there can be an element of yeah, if if these guys were really really good at quote unquote mossing guys, which used to be amazing, but now apparently it's just the baseline expectation. 
then yes, some more of these would be caught. But I'm not going to sit here and just pretend like what I'm seeing from the quarterback is fine and there's nothing wrong with it and we just need great wide receivers to catch bad balls. I'm just going to say no. I'm going to look at a pass and say that's a bad pass and needs to be better, period. Well, it could have been caught. Yeah, could have. Wasn't. Would have been if it was thrown better. It goes from like a 10% chance of a catch to like a 90% chance of a catch. It could have been dropped. That's true, but it's unlikely. So again, I'm, I'm fine saying Jordan had a good day. I'm not just going to make up this thing where he had a great day and all his passes are on target and all the drops are on the wide receivers. It's not true. And it's not just being spoiled by Aaron Rodgers because again, I can look at the data and it's not just, you know, good but not elite and we're spoiled. No, it's bad. It's just bad. So again, we're, without specific, we'd probably agree on a lot of specific throws, but there's just those... Certain ones that I'm looking at, like, come on, man, you guys are being ridiculous. Um, I don't know why Jones is dropping balls. I don't right. know why Jones is not. And again, like, the, the Jones drops are just straight-up drops. I mean, and nobody's arguing. And that's the thing. Nobody's arguing that. Nobody's looking at the actual drops and saying that's on Jordan. Nobody looked at the Christian Watson drop, you know, the one, not the one in the end zone, but the one where it hit him in the hands, and just like, oh, that was on Jordan if he'd throw it softer or harder or something. Like, that, that's not a thing that's happening. The drops are the drops, and the drops are a problem. That's a bad thing. And it's a, a, a knock on the receiver. It's a knock on the running back, whatever. Um, and those are happening. That is a real thing, the, the inability to catch. I'm not going to pretend that it's not. And I've addressed it, I'm pretty sure, on like every podcast. But um, again, it's just, th- th- there's just like those, those little middle ground areas where we're just not agreeing. Going out of bounds or just batting that ball down at the end of the game? Oh, that, to me, that was like the... There were some big mistakes by Jones in this game. That was so weird yeah. to catch that ball and then cut it up the field in the last drive instead of just getting out of bounds. I mean, that that was just, I don't understand. Why would you do that? What what on earth? Like, what, are you going to get four more yards? Like, And that's 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 a veteran. And, and again, that's part of the reason why like I'm not super buying the whole it's a young team thing. Because, again, young has nothing to do with the drops. And Young has nothing to do with Aaron Jones, period. And he's been, you know, again, I mean, the the biggest drop issue as a percentage is Aaron Jones on this team. Anyways, I was interrupted. Don't remember where we left off. But Kyle, appreciate the call. Uh, Chris from Alabama. Oh, what's going on, Ryan? Chris from Alabama, man. What's going on, man? Uh, Well, the game is over and another loss um, for this year. Uh... I really don't know how to feel about it. I really don't know how to feel about this game. I mean, it was overall a good game, in my opinion. I have to really have to watch it again because I was watching it. But as I was watching it, I was more so listening to it because I was traveling home uh, for pretty much the first half. So I really just didn't get dialed into the second half. But, I mean, throws that I saw... For the most part, were good throw, couple of drops, couple of throws that were like, ah, you might need to have that old back, and you know, a couple of them was good decisions as far as nobody there throw them away, so that's going to count against the completion percentage or whatever. But yeah. uh, besides the interceptions, which the tilt, I mean, you can say it was a tilt ball that happens last play. Maybe instead of if you want to go to Washington, maybe instead of trying to throw. A direct line, maybe draw up some for him to go up and catch it, throw it towards the back of the end zone, and let him go up and get it. Whoever you would have throw to, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, I guess it depends on how you're looking at it. Uh, we one step closer to try to get a top five pick with the loss, yeah. and if you were one of the people that maybe was looking for. One of those miraculous turnarounds, and it was kind of a dab on you. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't have any feelings. I guess you can tell by the energy of this phone call, but it just don't have, I just don't have no feelings about anything. I'm basically at this point just watching, but it was one of them heartbreakers we lost in the end, and we'll see what happens next week. We'll see if we can improve on the little things, I guess take more victories, good blocking from the line for the most part. Uh running and passing. Just just by looking. Like I said, I wasn't looking very hard. Might tell a different story once the grades come out, but 
It looked like it was overall good blocking. And they just overall, to me, looked it a lot better than last week. It wasn't a lot of mistakes. It was some mistakes in key moments, but not a lot of them. So I guess I guess you can look at that as a positive. But anyway, go Pack go, and I'll talk to y'all later. Yeah, I think maybe an underrated narrative is the fact that the offense actually did a fairly good job when you factor in the Steelers' defense. I mean, we lost the game, so that's obviously a negative. And then we got a battle about who made the most mistakes, whether it's Jordan Love or the receivers, when in reality it's a little bit of both, like it has been with everything else. But really, I mean, you know, the offense, I thought the, even when you when they asked the receivers, they asked Christian Watson, I think they talked to Jaden Reed and even Musgrave or whatever at their locker room, like, what can you guys do better? And I, pretty much all of them said, we did a pretty good job this week. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, again, it's not perfect and stuff needs to be cleaned up. But, I mean, that's a pretty good offensive performance. Um, and I think we should be probably celebrating it a little bit more than we are. Uh, it wasn't great. It wasn't elite. I'm, I'm not talking about doing backflips, but I think we spend more time critiquing. And uh, in reality, I mean, you know, it, it's been a couple of weeks in a row of of the offense kind of showing something. Again, had I remembered to ask people, like, what what is that line where if they do better than this, you're going to feel good about the performance? I'm guessing most people would not have set the bar as high as they did. I mean, who knows? I mean, look, what do they get, 19 points? That's not necessarily the greatest thing in the world, but... You know, they, they were able to move the ball against a, a tough defense. They were able to hold up along the offensive line against a good pass rush. Jordan Love was able to play well under pressure. We were able to generate big explosive plays, which means good play calling, good passing, and good route running and good catching. And instead, we're kind of complaining about bad play calling, bad passing, and bad catching. And it's like, I mean, they, they did it. Not perfectly, and it could be better, and it needs to be better, but... Um, you know, perfect isn't attainable. So if we factor in that it's never going to be perfect, you look at it and go, yeah, I mean, it, it tighten it up a little bit. But I mean, very honestly, if, if the defense had done its job and then held the inept Steelers offense to a point total that is more indicative of how good their offense actually is, we end up winning this game and are talking about, you know, it's a, it's a good, it was a good game, not perfect, but offense and defense stepped up, did their job and we won. So, you know, again, I, I, I do want to talk honestly about stuff that didn't go well, but I don't want to spend all our time just talking about what didn't go well. And again, I don't like the fact that I'm sounding so anti-Jordan Love when I want to come into this saying I liked his performance. It's just, I just feel like I'm constantly pulling in the other direction. Like, that's that's too much. That's too far. we got to rein it in a little bit. Because I do think it was mostly positive. Mostly positive for the receivers, mostly positive for the quarterback, mostly positive for the offensive play calling mostly positive for the offensive line and they're trending in the right direction which is great so anyways uh why don't we take our first break we'll come back and hear from nico hey u.s cellular customers i've got good news so don't hit skip forward just yet i'm talking about their special customer event us days what's us days it means exclusive offers just for their customers just to say thanks like up to twelve hundred dollars to upgrade to any new phone No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo Concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Well, that was a tough one to swallow, Uh, Nico. Couple things. I know I was online briefly. People just giving away. Uh, honestly, that play where uh, back in the end zone, uh, if it was just slightly better, but that pass was three feet towards the corner, just like the pass to Doss, the touchdown, that was beautiful. That pass has been more like that. I think we are having a different conversation. Uh, it was just too much close to where the defender could get it. And he did it. He made a good defensive play. Obviously, that uh, 
what should have been called as a backwards pass. Loose ball, walk-in touchdown from Gary, was blown dead. Don't know why the refs are stupid, um, but at least they're consistently stupid. If that play goes as it should, we probably win the game. Um, but, you know, the, the team, I, I almost see it as a win-win. Hear me out. The team showed some spunk. Yeah, they had some, they had some you know, some imperfections, but every team's going to have that. But they kind of fought, they fought back, and they made it close. They could have given up when it was like, what, 14 to 3 or 14 to 6 or whatever, or 21. I don't know, when they had a, uh, uh, Steelers had a big lead, but they fought back. They scored another touchdown in the first half. Um, some people did some good things. We, at times, could stop the run. You know, they kind of gashed us at first, and then the defense came out and was really holding them, and that's where what allowed us to catch up. Um, obviously, if they don't get that kick blocked, you know, the extra point, mm-hmm. we're kicking for overtime as opposed to trying to throw a touchdown. That's a huge, true. huge thingy. But um, still, I think the team fought. I like Musgrave. Reed, Wicks, those guys are coming on. I don't think we, honestly, I think maybe the Watson thing is a LaFleur thing because it's, he's not, I don't know if he's designing plays for him. Like, I think once we get to the 50 yard line, that's when, that's when it's Watson distance, right? Uh, but I don't know, we're not taking advantage of that. Um, Jones, they couldn't, he couldn't run outside the line and the third linebackers are too good and, and, and safeties. Um, and uh, Dylan looked pretty good. So like I said, it's a win-win. We kind of played good, but didn't really win, so it didn't really affect our draft position. Uh, we could just do that with every game, <laughs> kind of grow, but maybe not win and get a top five draft pick. I would be okay with that. Uh, so, hey, go Pacto. Well, yeah, that's that's kind of becoming a uh, popular consensus, I guess, is the idea of, hey, if we could look good and lose, I mean that's fine. I mean look good look look good and win is is also fine. Cuz honestly looking good is kind of the most important part. I know that sounds stupid but give us a reason to believe that there's some some semblance of talent cuz otherwise again if we go back to where we were before for several weeks which some people are stirred, we don't have any good players. Everybody sucks and everybody sucks sometimes. But I'm talking about like you just straight up suck. But if I can watch that and go you know Maybe maybe Jordan does have. Eh, maybe we got some receivers. Maybe that uh, draft wasn't too bad with old Musgrave there and Wixie boy, Jaden Reed. What's going on? In fact, and this is such a small sample size, it's stupid to bring this up as like a main topic on the podcast tomorrow, so I'll just talk about it. Over the last two weeks, which is when, you know, Jordan Love has looked pretty good and the offense has looked pretty decent and Looking at rookie receivers, wide receivers slash tight ends, let's say. Anybody catching passes. Looking at receiving grade, there are 40 people that qualify. Rookie, wide receivers slash tight ends that have actually... Dontavian Wicks ranks 6th with a 72.5 grade. Luke Musgrave ranks 4th with a 74.1 grade. And Jaden Reed is 3rd with a 74.4 grade. Sam Laporta and Jalen Brooks are the only two that are higher. If you look at yard. Dontavian Wicks is 8th with 99 yards. Jaden Reed is 7th with 103 yards. And Luke Musgrave is hundred is 6th with 115. So there's 6th, 7th, and 8th. Only 8 rookies over the last 2 weeks have had touchdowns. 2 of them are Luke Musgrave and Jaden Reed. And if you look at overall grades, Dontavian Wicks is 8th, Luke Musgrave is 6th, and Jaden Reed is 5th. Again, really small samples. And I didn't I chose the last two weeks. I saw somebody had made a, a, a point about the last three weeks. I don't think that helps anybody. Hilariously, if you look at targets, um, Luke Musgrave is tied with four or with three other people with eight targets. Two of those three people are Dentavian Wicks and Jaden Reed. <laughs> it's four people with eight targets, and three of them are passed. If you look at yards per route run, Dentavian Wicks is third. And actually, if we remove minimum targets here, um, Dontavian Wicks is number one, Jaden Reed is number two, and Luke Musgrave is number five. That's only out of 16, but so, I mean, they're coming along. Reason for optimism. You got to understand, it's like, well, yeah, it's rookies, whatever. Okay, Jonathan Mingo, who I really liked, I think was a second round pick. Did it do, 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 yep, second round pick, as were two of the people we're talking about, 
is dead last out of the six. After uh, coming in 15th is Jalen Hyatt, another guy a lot of Packer fans wanted. Coming in 14th is Quinton Johnson, who is a first round pick. Coming in 13th is Michael Mayer. Coming in 11th is Puka Nakua. Coming in ninth is Jordan Addison. Coming in eighth is Zay Flowers. Coming in seventh is Jackson Smith and Jigba. Coming in sixth is Dalton Kincaid. I mean, these aren't just some random scrap undrafted free agents. These are basically all first and second round pick. Almost all of them. So they're doing they're doing a good job. Again, being able to continue doing it is the biggest question. But we shouldn't really be spending too much time whining and complaining about. If you want to be upset about run defense, but overall. It was it was fine. It was fine. Hey, Ryan. This is Aaron. Uh, no one my last... It just reminds me of the office. Wasn't there a line in there? He's like, fine. Is that what we're going for? Because we used to go for pretty good. <laughs> Caller said I was going to miss the Packers game because I had to go watch the Golden Bachelor with a friend, which I did do, but I didn't miss... I mean, I missed the game because of not broadcasting in Minnesota. Okay. But we finished the Golden Bachelor before the game started and... Obviously, the game is out of reach for me because of where I live, um, and I think that is discrimination. Sounds if you right. ask me, everyone should be allowed to watch the Packers game. But anyway, it's a va- very valid point. Wait, um, so I kind of followed along via the radio and the play-by-play and everything, and it seemed like every other week where there's really, 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 really good parts, but then there's other parts where we shot ourselves in the foot and. Um, I watched the highlights later on, and Jordan Love had some really, really phenomenal throws. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the interceptions I can't really put on anyone other than Jordan Love because the one that Patrick Peterson tipped was under, oh, slightly underthrown to Christian Watson, and um, and then Jordan Love on the last play basically threw it directly into this wall that they had created on defense. And yeah, and again, I would love if somebody could kind of, I'm sure somebody already has, but kind of break down that last play and explain to me what was supposed to happen because I'm watching it and it's like, this makes no sense. Like the play's never going to work the way that it sounds like is being designed. Again, unless he's supposed to wait until Watson clears that defender and then you throw it, which maybe could work. But I'm looking at it like, bro, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. Like I don't understand. And they're making it sound like this is the preeminent play to run against this defense. And I'm like, I I don't understand, but maybe maybe somebody can kind of help me understand how that's supposed to work. And instead of trying, but again, that's not an excuse to just beeline it at a defender, like just throw it right at his chest, because that's probably not a great plan either. Like lob it to the back of the end zone to give our receivers a shot. Um, but anyways, it's just the same thing as every week, where it's there's really good parts. But then because of stupid mistakes and, like, just someone making a mistake. It's not always the same person. It's not usually someone different. Um, but, yeah, anyways. So my thoughts are, what is it? Can you explain to me what a run defense is? Because I just straight up don't know. Um, I might have – I'm currently watching the Giants and – Cowboys play, and I, it, that's not helping me understand what a run defense is at all. Um, but, yeah, anyways, um, yeah, hopefully we can minimize the mistakes because it, now it's coming down to the discipline and just poor timing of things, I guess. Um, And one quick thing, also, uh, the Golden Bachelor is actually very, very much more bearable than the regular Bachelor um, because people, there it's older people, and they kind of more mature, and it's not just a bunch of drama, which can be fun, but seeing people actually be friends and not just stupid all the time, it's pretty fun. But anyways, hopefully we can find out what a run defense is going forward. Uh, bye. And I, I kind of think that's one of the other reasons I take this as a positive because, you know, the, the constant refrain that this is a young team, that's generally not what I'm seeing, but I kind of feel like that's a little bit more of what we've seen the last couple weeks. Um, again, some of this is just bad play or whatever, but if you're 
trying to think of a team that is talented but young, it sounds a lot like what you're describing. Like some things look really good. The passes look really like big plays and all this, but they're also just doing a lot of stupid stuff. That's how I would have expected this season to to be described. So I'm going to take it as a positive. Should I? Maybe not, but I'm going to. So my ADHD self completely forgot another point I was going to make. So everyone's been talking about like Luke, Luke Musgrave and why he keeps falling and everything. And I've, what I've noticed over the past few weeks, when the ball gets thrown to him, he for some reason turns his body completely right. back around. Even, like, even if he doesn't need to. Um, he just turns his body completely back around towards... It's almost like a lack of confidence, you know? Like, he doesn't trust himself to track the ball. So when the ball's coming, he's like, I got to turn around. I got to see this coming in. I got, you know what I mean? Like, that's not how you're supposed to do it. I, I just, I don't know. It's weird because I can't imagine he got this far and was never taught how to, you know, track a ball over your shoulder. But I, I, I don't, it's very weird. It's very, I, 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 all I can think is there's been a lot of issues with drops and he's been a big part of that. And he just is panicked and is like, I can't drop this. So I'm going to turn around and I'm going to just whole body catch this thing. I'm going to wrap this thing up with a big old bear hug and uh, do my best to turn back around and run. And he does not do a good job of the last part. Where the ball's coming from, which then when it comes time to actually get himself, him being a kind of tall, skinny guy, I don't want to say super skinny because he's a tight end. But anyways, he tries to get his body contorted around to get start running down field, which kind of throws off balance. Um, and so it would be nice to see, like, if especially if Jordan Love puts the ball in a position where he doesn't need to turn around, where he can just kind of get an over-the-shoulder catch. I don't know if he's comfortable with, uh, uncomfortable with over-the-shoulder catches or whatever, but I just haven't seen him try to make one of those. It's always that he fully turns around and tries to catch it, and that's not good for that situation, and that probably contributes to why he's falling down so much. Um, but that's just an observation I've made over since forever. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Peace. Yeah, and I, I think I came to the party late, so I don't know if this is every time or part of the time or what the issue is, but the, the two times I saw him uh, catch it and fall down, that's exactly what is happening. He's turning around. And sometimes like the ball kind of comes in an awkward, it's in an awkward spot, so when you find it, it's like, I don't exactly know what to do here. Um, but, I, I, I mean, I don't think that's the case. And again, a lot of times that's still on the, you, you know, you got to, see it at a certain point in the air and then adjust to it like if it's going to hit you in the middle of your back and you got to turn around and catch it you probably shouldn't have run that far kind of thing you know i don't know it's weird i don't don't fully understand it but it just kind of contributes to like the overall issue with the receivers which again i I don't think is fully on them all these issues but they do feel kind of clumsy you know like they're not one of the things i've always liked one of my favorite attributes of a receiver are people that make it look easy and our guys make it look really difficult. And sometimes they make the really difficult catches, but you know, sometimes it's like, come on, man. It doesn't have to be that hard. What's going on? It's Omar the Firefighter. How y'all doing? What's going on? Uh I wanna so I did get to watch most of the game. Um I will not super bad short love. Um I think this is probably one of his best games as far as like what I like to see in a QB. Um, but at the same time, I saw a lot of balls where receivers was falling on the ground, rolling over to catch them. Like, I saw at least three of them like that. And, I mean, I kind of find that a little not up to par. Um, also, he is, you know, he was the lowest rated uh, starting QB for his completion rating, completion percentage. So, I don't want to ignore that. But he did look better. So I will give him his props on improving and looking a lot better. Um, so this is the first game where I watched and I kind of was just like, ah, it didn't matter if we win or lose. That's why I, that's, I really didn't care. I was just watching. And I enjoyed it. I mean, it was, a, it, it was an enjoyable game. I'm not 100% mad we lost because we didn't have this starters missing. You know, I felt like the backups played well, 
and uh, to see it's, it's actually the perfect loss, which is probably never a perfect loss, but it was the perfect one because I saw a lot of people play hard. I saw a lot of the young people on our team play hard, um, and that's what I wanted to see. But I will say this: Marvin Harrison Jr. will look excellent in the Green Bay Packers jersey. <laughs> So if we get picked number three or whatever, that's, I'm not gonna be crying. You know what I'm saying? Then get a tackle in the second. We got two second rounds. We can build that team up nice. So, you know, and he can catch those passes that Love overthrows sometimes or underthrow, and mm-hmm. maybe he can catch one out of him on the ground. Well, and that's the thing too. It's it's you know some of these are you know ten percent, twenty percent, not fifty fifty balls, but some guys they get those. Right, and it's it's not just strong hands. Sometimes it's just body positioning and all these kind. Of, you know, when to track the ball, how to track the ball, tempo and pace, and like there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and some guys are just naturally better at that kind of stuff. Now that doesn't excuse. No matter what, it doesn't excuse Jordan. You need to be able to throw good balls, but um, it certainly wouldn't hurt to stop drafting guys that have bad hands. Let's put it that way. But um, I think Jordan Love can improve and be a. Efficient starting QB. Uh, I did enjoy the play calling. Um, the trick play, even though Jones dropped the ball, it was a good play if, like, Jones caught it. Um, I do see some tough decisions coming. Like, I don't, I do, as much as we paying Jones, I don't know if we keep him. I do love him yeah. and hope we keep him. And he can train, like, the next running back. But I definitely, you know, probably will let Dylan go. You know, but anyway... Go back, go. Uh, just sit back and enjoy the game, folks. That's all I can say. Win, lose, or draw. Go back, go. Yeah, we did it for the receivers. Why don't we look at Jordan Love over the last three weeks? Because that's kind of when he's kind of turned things around. We'll do the last two also because I think it gets a little bit better. Overall, quarterbacks with a minimum of dropbacks, whatever. There's 36 total quarterbacks. Jordan Love ranks eighth between Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts with a 78.4 overall grade. Passing grade, ninth between Jalen Hurts and Derek Carr. Um, in terms of yardage, he ranks 10th with 746 yards, uh, tied for 10th with 10 touchdowns. His big-time throw percentage is 7th between Sam Howell and Kyler Murray. Sam Howell's actually doing kind of well. I only know that because my son has him in fantasy, and he's like, he's like, he's the third-best quarterback right now. I'm like, you're full of crap. Um. Turnover-worthy plays, uh, tied for 7th with Dak Prescott, 7th best, just 1.5% turnover-worthy plays, and it's a 6% big-time throw percentage. Um, His adjusted completion percentage, where is he? He's 21st, so even that is still not the greatest, uh, and that's adjusted completion percentage. It has nothing to do with drops or anything like that, although he has faced 7 drops, which is tied for the second most. Tua has the most with 8 C.J. Stroud and Jordan Love, seven. As far as a percentage, though, um, eighth. Brett Rippon, Aiden O'Connell, Tommy DeVito, Kirk Cousins, Kenny Pickett, Tua, and Clayton Toon all have more. Now, a lot of these guys have not played as much, but still. Uh, Let's see. Time to throw Jordan Love. Wasn't going to do this many, but why not? He's 17th at 2.8. His passer rating is 19th. Now, if we look at the just the last two weeks, which is when he's had his two games in the 70s or whatever, Um, Jordan Love is ranked sixth between Russell Wilson and Joe Burrow. His passing grade ranks seventh between Jalen Hurts and Russell Wilson. He's thrown for the eighth most yards, uh, 516. Big time throw percentage is seventh, tied with Jameis Winston and Brock Purdy. When you do small sample sizes, you get weird stuff, but whatever, we're going to roll with it. Um, Turnover worthy plays, he's tie, uh, he's seventh with just one point three percent, and he has a passer rating of eighty nine, which obviously isn't fantastic. Uh, the interceptions are kind of dragging that down, but he is sixteenth there. Even more interesting though is you know how is he doing in some of these other categories? So on deep passing, the last two weeks, Jordan Love is third as far as his passing grade with a ninety three point nine passing grade 11 attempts seven completions 230 yards and a touchdown he is third for yards um he is third in completions behind only cj stroud and dak prescott big time throw percentage is fourth and this is out of uh 27 8 9 30 quarterbacks 
He is sixth in adjusted completion percentage, 63.6% adjusted completion percentage. And his NFL passer rating is fourth. So to go from like the worst deep passer in the NFL to over two weeks now, which again, small sample size, but it is what it is. It's it's what we've been asking for. It's a start. He is, you could argue, a top five deep passer over the last two weeks. And then under pressure, he is third with a passing grade of 76.8 behind only Dak Prescott and Jared Goff. So the two biggest weaknesses over the last two weeks have become his two biggest strengths. Again, you're right, and everybody that has mentioned it is right. It's not perfect. There are still underthrown balls. There are still some issues. But these are the two biggest issues that I've seen, aside from like not starting in the first quarter, which also was rectified this past week. If he can continue this, and remember, the Steelers have a tough defense. If you can continue playing like this, we're headed in the right direction. So we all might not 100% agree on to what degree Jordan is killing it, but this is impressive. And at this point, it is about consistency. Just keep doing this. Anyways, let's take our final break. We'll come back. We got a whole lot of Kyle from Madison. Brian, Kyle from Madison. What's up, buddy? What's up? It is Moral Victory Monday. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, I'm not even going to say anything else. Um, yeah, so I'm about to fire up the after dark from the post game. And I want to just call in quick before I'm affected by others' opinions and just um, after having had a little bit of time to let the game settle in, just give a couple extra thoughts I had. Um, and yeah, I'm still really upset with some of the officiating and that and the, the lateral. But all in all, I mean, if you would have gone to my head, what do you want to see outside of a Packers victory this week? I would have said I wanted to see Jordan Love show that he can connect on the deep ball and, um, you know, continue to improve. That would be the most important thing this week. <laughs> and that's exactly what I saw. Agreed. So as much as I am ride or die with the Packers every week, I want us to win, and I hated that we didn't win because it was just right there for us, for just tantalizingly close. Felt we played better than the Steelers. Um it wasn't to be, but all in all, that's, you know, I, I am pretty excited to see this. I've been waiting. I think we've all been waiting for that, that deep ball to come alive. The surprising thing is that it didn't come alive to Watson. And, um, I don't know what to make about that. I don't know why we can't get Christian, Christian Watson and Jordan Love cooking together. That's like, that, that one's a little more <clears throat> confusing to me. The only thing I will, add to the conversation because you're right about that is there does seem to be a very strong relational aspect between quarterback and wide receiver if you remember Aaron Rodgers couldn't hit MVS to save his life he just couldn't Rodgers is a very good quarterback they just could not get on the same page Christian Watson comes in Rodgers was lights out for whatever reason just on the freaking money and Jordan and Christian are just not in sync right now. The timing, um, which comes down to Jordan, it also comes down to the right route running, and just there's a lot that goes into it, and they're just not in sync. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if that's just they need to work on it or if it's just going to be a problem. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I hope there isn't, like, going to be – well, of course there will be. What am I saying? I, I was just going to say I would hope there's not going to be, like, these – the pro Christian Watson and then the pro love people, but I'm sure that's going to be a thing. Like what, what am I saying? Of course it'll be a thing. It shouldn't be. Um, now I do think it's, <clears throat> it's maybe a conversation where you want to get, I, at some point here, you got to get whips more snaps, right? Like, I mean, he just keeps ascending and ascending and ascending and ascending. It does kind of feel like madness that we keep trying to go into the Watson in, in these big spots when you have these ascending players, but at the same time, I understand, like, you, you really, you got to get Christian Watson and Jordan Love, like, on the same page. Like, kind of the whole thing revolves around that. So, I don't know. I'm in two minds there. Um, <clears throat> but that's a really good defense uh, Pittsburgh has there. And overall, I mean, I'm, I'm upset we didn't win, but uh, I'm fairly optimistic about a lot of the stuff I saw. Um, well, I better call back a lot. Yeah, I mean, the tough thing about Wicks is, 
I think what most people would like is replace Watson with Wicks. And not all the time, but but you know, push in that direction. Less Watson, more Wicks. But I think Watson's role is similar to what MVS's role was. MVS wasn't a weapon in terms of his ability as a receiver. He was a weapon because of his speed. And I think Watson provides something that has to keep the defenses on their toes. And if you assume Wicks is not going to play in the slot, it really comes down to Wicks versus Dobbs. It doesn't have to be. You can do Dobbs and Wicks or whatever. Um, But I just think they're really hesitant to take that speed off the field. So I think that could potentially be part of the complication. Um, And I think Dobbs and Jordan are uh, in sync. So it's, it's... not massively beneficial or, uh, you know, trending in any particularly uh, better way to have Wicks over Dobbs, in my opinion. But yeah, find a way to get Wicks on the field more, whether that's four wide receivers or, you know, if you got to pull Watson and try to do some stuff or pull Dobbs or put him in the slot or whatever, I don't know. But um, I'm in general agreement. When you have something that's working, you got to find a way to get it, get more of it. And Wicks is working. Hey, Kyle from Madison, part two here. Um, you know, I hate that uh, <laughs> that love ends these games with with interceptions because I think, uh, well, obviously, goes without saying, not great. Um, I have some forgiveness in this case. I mean, I don't honestly. I thought that the the um, decision making was a little better in this one. I'm sure there'll be a lot of opinions on that, but like, I don't know. I went to um, <clears throat> a party last night. And, Somebody's going off about how you just should never throw that because the safety is right there. And I, I don't know. I've watched it a couple times. Like, yeah, the safety gets there, but it's, like, late. And, yeah, he gets the interception. But, you know, he, it was a tight throw. He, I thought he tried to squeeze it in there. It wasn't – I would have liked to probably see him scramble there. It looked like he had a little room. I did hear LaFleur after the game, and he didn't like that decision. But I didn't think it was some, like – oh, my gosh, you know, on fire type of, uh, you know, transgression and love committed going there. I just think better options, and um, it was actually a really nice play. I don't know if that – was that the Peterson? I'm trying to think who was on coverage. It was actually a really nice defensive play. And the Steelers' defense is legit. Um, I had read it going into the week that their run defense wasn't so good, but certainly tightened up on us. Um, that was the other thought I had, though. Um, obviously Aaron Jones made some really costly mistakes. Um, I don't, I hope, I hope he's not like done. I, I don't think that's the case yet, but I will say this. I would like to see LaFleur, and I don't have any issues really with the play calling. Like some people are complaining about, um, throwing early downs, but I don't have a problem with that. And I actually like that LaFleur is like, you know what, let's run it here. Even if we get three, it's setting up third and six, third and seven for the young quarterback. I, I don't mind the play calling. I really don't. I don't know. I thought it was actually pretty good. But I would like LaFleur to have a little better pulse on which running back is, is getting it going because I thought the run blocking was better. And But Dylan had the mojo. Like, Jones did not. It was pretty obvious. And then he kept trying to force feed Jones, and he's just not – it's not working. I would have loved to see him try and ride Dylan a little more in this game. But um, all in all, the uh, – I think I'm thinking all in all a lot. The point after really, uh, that really was that, that point really hurt us just for what, you know, what you could, what you were forced to go for from then on. Um, so we were kind of waiting for the special teams to kind of cost us one. I would say this might have been it, even though it wasn't like a last second field goal miss. The PAT miss hurt. All right, buddy. Talk to you later. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm on board with all, most of that, anyways. Um, Aside from the final play, because number one, I mean, you mentioned you didn't mind the play. Maybe you just meant generally or whatever, but um, like I said, I didn't really fully understand the intent of it, having you know looked at it. Also, again, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I, I don't feel like it was a tremendously fantastic play by the defender because he basically just stood there and the ball was thrown directly to him. He had to step up and go. I mean, he, he ran to the ball. Um but that's about it. He just kind of moved forward to where the ball was and caught it. If I'm rem- I'm, and maybe I'm remembering wrong. I don't know. I will say, going back and trying to find that one, I, I do think um, I'm a little bit lower on Watson on that first pick. The ball was underthrown, but here, here's sort of, I think, where it, it depends on a play-to-play thing. 
In this particular play, the biggest problem I have is Watson saw the ball pretty early. Some of these, you turn around and you see where the ball is, and it's like, it's, it's bull crap. But he saw the ball early and kept on running. And I, I think the, you know, again, ideally the ball is thrown out in front so that you can, you know, just run and catch it and it's uncontested. But I think in that case, you have to stop, right? Because my whole thing is like, you're trying to stop, you turn around, you don't have time. You, that's why you end up falling. But I, I mean, it's hard to tell. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going like frame by frame in slow motion, trying to see when he sees the ball and all this stuff. It's hard. It, it, again, it's easier for me to just sit here and, and say it, but I, it seems to me that it would have been possible for him to kind of put on the brakes and jump up and really make a better effort on the ball. And more than likely, if you do that, rather than running and fading away, um, you're, you're at the very least, you're going to get that pass interference because he's going to run right through you. Because if you just put on the hard brakes and try to jump, he's going to smash right into your ribs and it's a pass interference. Now, the second pick, I mean, nobody's going to do anything about that. And again, the first one, the ball was still not thrown properly, but I, I do think that needs to be something like if you identify the ball, there needs to be something in your brain that says, oh, crap, and you got to quickly be able to adjust. Right? It's maybe not where you're planning on running, but you got to go where the ball is. And again, easier said than done in slow motion, but I will concede that much. All right, let's do the final one from Kyle, and then we'll get out of here. Hey, Kyle from Madison one last time. Um, quick question. Is it just me or is like... Whether it's, I don't care if it's CBS or whoever, it seems like every channel, every network has their guy, but man, watching some of these broadcasts now with the officiating, it feels like watching some like state TV, like some communist state TV, <laughs> like whenever the referees make some terrible decision, they have to get on the guy, come in like Dean Blandino and tell us like how dear leader actually made the right choice. It was the perfect call. And we're all, we are all confused about the call because that was the right call. Even if that person has said like 30 seconds earlier how what how this call is going to be overturned, this will be the Packers ball, and then they make the call. And actually, that's the right call. It, it, it's so, like, is that a requirement that the networks have? Like, do they have to just be complete sycophants to, to the to the freaking NFL head office so they lose, like, broadcast rights? Or, or what, is, what is the deal there? It's so nauseating. It, it, I mean, it just disgusts me that we have to have that person come on and just tell us what we're seeing isn't what we're seeing and then everything was great i don't understand it's just it's gross all right thanks yeah i mean to be fair i have heard instances where they have come on and said you know i i think that was the wrong call or whatever but th there is far too often um a defense and i i feel like this started Oh, several years ago, before the refs even started coming on, which I, I'm glad that they started doing that because sometimes it can kind of help clarify why things are happening the way they are. But I think it's just another layer of people saying bull crap that's wrong and it just ticks you off. But this started a while ago when it felt like the announcers were being told to stop going after the refs because the refs were really getting hammered. And I think the league told them to kind of cool it with that. I don't remember if that was explicitly said or what the situation was. But I, I do know that that was a thing. And then they add in the refs. And it does make sense that it's like we're doing this in, in a continued effort to get people off the refs back a little bit, to be able to go in there and defend them live. Not that it has to be that way, but it, I, I do think that that's part of the goal of having them on there. Not to, to you know critique the refs, but there's an issue with the NFL. And one of the biggest issues between their, with the product is, is the referee. So their solution is, let's put a ref on there to explain to the, to the little people why they're wrong. And I think it, it's turned into this, where it's like, oh, cool. So the refs suck and you're a lying freaking D-bag. Great. Thanks. But anyways, guys, I really appreciate all the calls. Thank you so much. We've got plenty, plenty to get through. Um, keep sending them in. I'll, start, I'll probably have to start putting them on the back end of the regular Packernet. Um, podcast episodes we've got 27 more to get through and i will do my best to rip through those but please have a good rest of your night i will talk to you tomorrow have a good one Bye bye